But what did you go out to see, a prophet? Yes, I tell you, and more than a prophet, this is he of whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger before your face, who shall make ready your way before you. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. A few doctrinal things about John the Baptist. Preaching my sermon on him today. A few doctrinal things before we get into the meat of how he applies to today. The Catholic Church teaches that John the Baptist was born without original sin. Unlike Mary, his first cousin once removed, John the Baptist was, in fact, conceived in original sin, but he was born without original sin. How can that be? The church teaches that it was when his mother Elizabeth brought him in utero to Mary, the mother of God, when Mary spoke, the Baptist was justified. For behold, as soon as the voice of thy salutation sounded in my ears, the infant in my womb leaped for joy. It's in Luke chapter 1, and the church teaches that's when John the Baptist was freed of all original sin. And earlier in that chapter, for John shall be great before the Lord, and shall drink no wine nor strong drink, and he shall be filled with the Holy Ghost even from his mother's womb. Filled with the Holy Ghost even from his mother's womb. That's why the church teaches he never committed a mortal sin, nor even a venial sin his whole life. St. John the Baptist's father, Zechariah, or Zachary in the Dewey Rhymes Bible, he was a, of a priestly family. And remember, there was two priesthoods in the Old Testament. The first priesthood went from Abraham to Moses, roughly about 2000 BC to 1200 BC. And that was the time when all Jews fathers were the priests of the family. Every father of a family was the very priest of that family. But because this got messed up in Moses' time, God sort of had a concessionary law where only those in Aaron's line, the tribe called Levites, got to minister in the temple. Well, 1200 to zero, that includes Zachary, that includes Jesus, that includes this time when Jesus was born, meaning it was the Aaronic priesthood, the Levite priesthood, who was ministering in the temple when Jesus was born. Well, one of those priests was the father of John the Baptist named Zechariah. So Zachary, or Zechariah, was offering incense in the temple, and at this moment he sees the angel Gabriel. Remember what I said last week about seeing an angel? It was not a sweet experience. Luke 1, 11 to 12 says, And there appeared to him an angel of the Lord standing on the right side of the altar of incense. And Zachary, seeing him, was troubled, and fear fell upon him. John the Baptist is so important to Christian tradition that he is a necessary member of the iconostasis. That's that wall that goes in front of the divine liturgy in the Eastern churches. He's a necessary member in that iconostasis. And he's also, in our tradition, in the traditional Latin Mass, he's mentioned at least five times every Mass, even more if you go to, say, a Mass of John the Baptist. You might notice he's in the Confidior once, second time he, uh, my altar server said the confederate said John the Baptist's name. He's in the Roman canon. And he's mentioned in the final gospel. So at least five times in the traditional Latin Mass, every single time John the Baptist is in there. So he's extremely important to our tradition. The last gospel says there was a man sent from God whose name was John. This man came for a witness to give testimony of the light that all men might believe through him. He was not the light, but was to give testimony of the light. The church fathers even call him the morning star. Why the morning star? Because that's the threshold between the night and the day. The night being the foreshadowing, the Old Testament, leading into the new covenant, which is the day. Doesn't mean that the Old Testament, that any of that is bunk or that we just see that as not divine revelation. Every word of the Old Testament is divinely inspired. But contained in it is the prophecy of the coming of Christ, and Christ fulfills it all. And John the Baptist is that bridge between the Old Testament and the New Testament. He is the necessary bridge between the Old Testament and the New Testament. He was born a Jew under the Roman Empire. The Catechism of Perseverance that one of our parishioners gave me describes the Roman Empire as this. Their morals were too shameful for description. The most revolting crimes were authorized by pagan religion, the silence of the law, or by custom, and were openly committed in the presence of everybody, young or old, rich or poor. Sound familiar? It's no wonder they arrest the one man strong enough to preach against the Jews following the Romans and such perversion. For this, he's arrested. Remember the Baptist is executed for defending the sanctity of marriage when no other religious leaders will speak up. John the Baptist is executed 
for defending the sanctity of marriage when no other religious leaders will speak up. Today in the Gospel, John the Baptist is already in prison for this. He sends his friends to Jesus to say, Are you he who is to come, or should we look for another? The church fathers say that the Baptist's faith was not wavering, but rather the Baptist was teaching his disciples or his friends. What was he teaching them? The church fathers are clear that John's faith was not faltering when he sent the disciples to Jesus from prison today. St. Jerome says that, quote, by this opportunity of seeing his signs and wonders, they might believe on him, and so might learn through their master's inquiry, close quote. In other words, what St. Jerome is saying is that John the Baptist sends his friends with the question, are you he who is to come? But he actually does this with the express purpose of them seeing Christ face to face and seeing those actual miracles. This is according to St. Jerome. It wasn't that John the Baptist was getting depressed in prison and needed a little encouragement. Well, that might be true, but there was no doubt in his faith. He sent him on so his disciples could see that Christ was the one fulfilling everything, according to St. Jerome. And I agree with him. This is how strong John's faith was, even alone there in prison. Shows that we can have depression and emotional problems and everything else and still hold on with our faith. As Cardinal Newman said, a thousand difficulties does not equal one doubt. We can have a lot of difficulties in our life, and that doesn't mean we have to voluntarily doubt. You see, John the Baptist was not some raving homeless man like the movies make him to be. Even his fire was gentle, say the mystics who saw the life of Christ. You'd see the same silent fire looking in John's eyes as you'd see in Mary's eyes, for they were related. And their hunger was the same. The mystics tell us that no one prayed harder for the coming of the Jewish Messiah than Mother Mary. And right behind her was John the Baptist in this desire. The Romans were breathing down the neck of the Jews, and yet all the prophecies were coming true that a Messiah was being born into the world. Not just the Jewish prophecies. In fact, the whole world was longing and ready for Christ. And even secular prophecies were coming to a conclusion in that first century. Think of the Magi. We know they were not Jewish, but they were given these signs across the Middle East that this king was being born. My favorite talk by Fulton Sheen is actually a very little-known talk by Fulton Sheen. It's a whole talk on how the pagan prophecies of the world were pointing to Christ. And he goes 500 years into this. Talks about Cicero, talks about Greek pagans, Roman pagans. They even identified that Bethlehem would be the spot where the Messiah would come from. Not just the Messiah for the Jews, the Messiah for all the Gentiles that we heard the Apostle Paul extolling in Romans 15 today. In fact, Fulton Sheen, and I trust him, I have never been able to find this anywhere besides his talk, but I trust him. He says that Buddha, who lived 500 years before Christ, said, I'm not the light of the world, the true light of the world is to come, and his name is Atriya. Atriya was that ancient Indian language for love. The Buddha predicted Christ, the true light of the world, who he called love. Love would be born into the world 500 years after the Buddha lived. The Catechism of Perseverance states, quote, when our Lord was born, all nations were expecting an extraordinary personage who would reign over the world and establish in it the empire of justice and virtue, close quote. This extraordinary personage is love, love himself. Christ, the Son of Mary, the Son of God, comes as a baby. The world, too, at this time was pregnant with tension, expectation, and longing for him, just like us today. Some, like the Essenes, went into the desert to seek intimacy and silence. Maybe others, maybe the zealots were disenfranchised with the Jewish religious leadership. Maybe some of those zealots even said, well, we see so much hypocrisy in the Pharisees. Well, if the religious leaders aren't holy, then I don't have to be holy. Interesting temptation, isn't it? Well, if the religious leaders aren't holy, I don't have to be holy. So Jesus quietly responds with this shocking line, For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Let's unpack that line into modern parlance. 
Jesus is saying, I know you want to use the excuse of how much hypocrisy you see in the religious leaders as your reason for not being holy, but that excuse won't get you to heaven. Again, his exact words, for I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Let's look at how John the Baptist applies today. The Council of Trent tells us that faith and repentance must come before the sacraments. A lot of times people tell me something sacramental thinking, I'm going to get very excited about it because they mention the sacraments. That's great. I'm all for the sacraments. But I think we've had a bigger problem in 50 years of people receiving the sacraments in an unprepared manner. I've said for a long time, we have a crisis of catechesis more than a crisis of people getting to the Holy Eucharist. Father Richard Heilman points out, we don't even have a crisis of catechesis. We have a lack of a hunger for catechesis is the bigger problem. John the Baptist comes in here because he's who we need today. Just as John the Baptist came before Christ, so also we Catholics need confession before the reception of the Holy Eucharist. The fire of John the Baptist had to come before Christ. Behold, I will send you Elias the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And he shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children and the heart of the children to their fathers, lest I come and strike the earth with anathema. You see, John the Baptist had to prepare the way for Jesus to physically walk into all their lives, all these families hungering for holiness. And yes, there were many. The Bible tells us all of Judea came out to John the Baptist. More proof he wasn't a raving lunatic like he's made to be in the movies because Mark 1.5 says all the country of Judea and all Jerusalem were going out to him and were being baptized by him in the River Jordan confessing their sins. These were real families needing someone who would be an authentic and honest leader with them. These people who were seeking God. John the Baptist was so holy that many people thought that he, John, was the Messiah. He confessed and did not deny, but confessed, I am not the Christ, says the Apostle John. And then John the Baptist, two chapters later, says of Jesus, He must increase. I must decrease. And he even said this, After me comes he who is mightier than I, the strap of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. You see, John the Baptist wouldn't have to protest so much if he weren't so holy. This isn't just proof of his humility, but also proof of his holiness that people actually concluded he was the Messiah. You see why he's so important to our Catholic tradition? Jesus himself says of John, Truly I tell you, among those born of women, there has arisen no one greater than John the Baptist. These are the words of our Lord. John and Jesus were a united front in the time of a lot of confusion in the religious leadership of the day. The Pharisees gave these legalistic answers that were really just covering their own tales, but didn't correspond to the longing of the hearts of the Jewish people of the first century for real holiness. And Jesus knew this, so first he sent us John the Baptist. Yes, we've all heard that some of the families were waiting for a military leader, but no one was stupid enough to think that a skinny man in an animal skin eating crickets was going to overthrow the Roman Empire. They were hungering for holiness. So why then did all of Judea go out to him? Precisely because they had a longing for something more than political and financial stability. They had a longing for holiness and divine intimacy. They were hungry for God. They were hungry for their sins to be forgiven. They were hungry for their rage and anger at family members to be abated. They were hungry for Jesus. But they didn't know it yet. And their hunger for holiness actually had to be increased even more before meeting Jesus. And this is the job of John the Baptist and Advent. The unique state of the church right now is very much like first century Judaism. That The Baptist also shows us today that we are called to very unique vocations in a very unique time. In maybe a confusing time. But to live a unique holiness. When the first century Jews could no longer rely on the Jewish governmental leaders to protect their families, the men had to learn something important about their spiritual leadership in the families, and John the Baptist actually brought this to light. So since John the Baptist spoke specifically to people, I want to speak something specific to the men 
and then specific to the women, and then specific to the children. He never gave ambiguous teachings. It was always very direct, like to the soldiers. So let's look at the men. Remember that John the Baptist's father, Zechariah, was in the temple like the Levite tribe of the priests before him, all the way back to Aaron. So the obvious question is, why isn't John the Baptist there in the temple all through the New Testament? Well, one theory is that the Baptist is already foreshadowing the priesthood of Melchizedek fulfilled in Christ, that original priesthood way back before the Aaronic priesthood was when every father was the priest of his family. Another theory, but very similar, is that the Baptist priesthood reflects even that of Adam in the garden before the fall, when Adam was called to guard the garden and his wife from the ancient serpent. Either way, John is showing a way of holiness that goes back even more traditional than the Pharisees' games of that law, these games that were only made for their own comfort and popularity. But John's not after popularity. He's after holiness. And like Adam, John the Baptist's temple was the entire dome of the cosmos, protecting his family under the stars from the ancient serpent. Remember, when Jesus died, the veil of the temple torn had an image of the stars on it, showing that the divine sacrifice reconciled all of creation with the living God. And in a certain sense, John the Baptist is preparing people for this, living the priesthood outside, literally outside of the River Jordan, protecting all his spiritual children, so when that veil breaks, they will be able to come streaming into the Catholic Church. Protecting his spiritual children, obviously spiritual, not physical since he's celibate, but protecting them from the evil of sin so they can know the Savior in honesty and in purity. And that is the calling of you dads out there, to protect your children from evil. Not to make excuses that priests are not teaching the truth so you don't have to either. But to live the original priest of Adam, protecting your family from the evil of sin. Where Adam fled in fear, John the Baptist and Jesus succeed in giving their life for their spiritual children. Because harder for us, I think, than dying for our children, spiritual or in your case physical, is living for them. This is what we need from you fathers. It's not to lock your children away in fear, but to equip your children against a world of sin so that they can know the Savior in honesty and purity. I'm not going back on what I said before, you know, remove all the near occasions of sin like smartphones. I didn't have a smartphone until I was 36. But equip your children against a world of evil, of sin, so that they can know the Savior in honesty and purity. So many Catholic kids, all the way from the charismatic world to the traditional world, leave the faith when they grow up. Father Ripperger compares it to the Amish, how many traditional kids crack and leave the faith because they were denied even holy ways of having fun as kids. I don't see that here, but it's something to realize. You push your kids too hard, they're going to crack, and they will leave. How do you equip them? Well, we spoke at length last week on the Catechism of the Catholic Church, but behind that, here's what the best thing you fathers can do. I got this a lot from Meg Meeker's book. She's a pediatrician best thing you fathers can do is just to spend time with your kids. I read statistic after statistic in that book to see the number one determinant for how your kids turn out is how much time the dad spends with the kids. Many kids who later struggle in life with same gender attraction usually can be healed and live normal lives, even married. But the ones who enter alternative unions, so to speak, were usually love-starved at home. Not always but frequently boys from their dads, girls from their moms. Yes, the kids nowadays growing up did probably not want to end up offending God so badly, but they were love-starved from a parent and did not know how to deal with it because often they had something missing in their life. This is not always the case, but it's sometimes the case. The solution is an increase in quality time. Father doesn't have to be cool or have all the theological answers or mathematical answers to the homework. Just be there for your children. Father Ribberger teaches that doing mildly dangerous things like hunting and rock climbing can increase purity because you care less for your body. Probably something more to do with the boys and the girls there. But the point is, boys and girls both need a father's quality time more than anything. If they leave the Catholic faith as young adults, I believe that they'll still come back to you because you were the only one who listened in those difficult times. John the Baptist always preached in specifics, so let me be specific on something for the mothers here, too. Once someone asked Alice von Hildebrand, what's the number one virtue that's missing nowadays? And without skipping a beat, she said reverence. 
reverence before God in the Blessed Sacrament, reverence between each other. I find it interesting that if you watch a sitcom, almost always the man is stupid and the woman smart. Why is it okay that the woman can make the man out to be stupid in sitcoms, but the man can't make the woman out to be stupid? Nobody laughs at that. I'm not saying anyone's stupid, nobody's stupid, but why is one of those accepted and the other isn't? I'll tell you why. You can usually learn what's happening by thinking a little bit with the mind of the enemy. Why do you think the enemy wants all families to think of the man of the house as stupid? Remember from last week that the will follows the intellect, the heart follows the brain. Man is called to be the head of the family, woman the heart. So if Hollywood can convince you that the brain is stupid, the whole family falls apart. Women, reverence your husbands. It doesn't mean worship the ground he walks on, but men will almost always live up to the reverence that you give him. Men will almost always live up to the reverence that you give him. So fake it till you make it. Fake reverence till you make him a man, ladies. Husband isn't much of a hero? Start treating him like a hero, and nine out of ten men will step up to plate. You want even more specifically? Never correct your husband in front of children or anyone else. Except for abuse or a situation that is dangerous physically or psychologically, of course, you should never correct him publicly. And I would actually give this vice versa to men too. United front or no front. A public correction is particularly devastating to a man because he'll have trouble respecting himself after that. Finally, how about something John the Baptist did for children? Remember John the Baptist was gentle, and so I want to speak very briefly to how children are to love. Children, remember Jesus did not say his disciples would be known by how they loved strangers. Christians would be known by how they loved each other. How they loved each other. If you want people to recognize you as a Catholic family, the very easy answer, children, is to love each other. But this love for each other can only come from intimacy with God. And intimacy comes from longing, and longing comes from silence. And by silence, I don't mean lack of babies crying. That's fine. You would have heard babies crying in line for John the Baptist. I mean the TV should almost always be off if you want this Christmas to mean anything. I'll admit I cracked this Christmas on um, not listening to Advent music, or rather I cracked this Advent and now I'm listening to Christmas music just to not be a Scrooge. But I've never owned a TV and I never will because I don't want it to get between me and God. Finally, imagine waiting in line for John the Baptist to baptize you. I believe it would have been extremely peaceful and extremely joyful. But joyful doesn't mean there would have been joking in line or, like I said, acting goofy. There would have been intense longing to begin a new life for God, manifested in a deafening silence. Imagine preparing yourself for your next confession like that. How would you prepare? What would it be like waiting in line? Would you cushion your language to sound pious? or approach the divine physician naked and vulnerable. St. Alphonsus Liguori said something like, if he were in line and there were two confessors, Jesus Christ and your average priest, it wouldn't matter to him which of the two he got, because either way it would be Jesus forgiving his sins. This Advent, we should hand over our sins in great hope that our coming Savior is greater than the worst sin a human could commit. This Advent, we should hand over our sins in great hope that our coming Savior is greater than the worst sin a human could commit. This Advent should instill in us feelings of intensity and peace. Everything we're supposed to feel this Advent as we long for the one and only Savior of the human race. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.